upstairs and he's he's watching on his iPad a little show at 2 a.m. in the morning. Oh, summer. And, uh, I'm so I'm like really dying here. I have a jacket. Oh, I'm I'm a jacket. Well, I have yeah. to say it was a nice thing to see school buses on the road. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mind being behind them. Are you kidding me? See kids waiting at the bus stop. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Happy birthday. They don't always
license renewed. It, it was. And it was the whole thing for the study reading it is that some of them get nervous about yeah. doing that so they don't jump for the license. So they basically don't have a license. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, the other thing is, okay, they can't get a car anymore. Well, over 85, if you call that a bunch of hits, it's not So this is kind of off. It's going to us up. So if you don't drive, you don't walk to the home. And study shows that you sit at home and do that. It's going to over 85, it's going to come down the street. You have to get it. I'm pretty healthy, but who knows? I'll be 81 this year. And the stone is telling the old is Everybody's here. Oh, I can't hear. And then he said, I'm here. I thought I was going to be second. I didn't know. I was going to be second. I was going to run for the first one. I guess they don't really get it. I guess they don't really get it.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Are you ready, Kim? Yep. Okay. All right. It's Friday morning voting. What could be better? <laughs> All right. First on the list is the House version of the um, HBCU. Yep, thank you. Um, so this is the HBCU bill. The House, um, you, you're going to have two things in front of you. Um, they did vote and amend the Senate bill, and you guys have possession of that. Um, and then you also have the House bill. So with the Senate bill, if you'll recall, um, you guys added a provision dealing with, in the event of a, a settlement for the CRF, that that you know, could be used to backfill the money. Um, the House accepted that on the Senate bill. The reprint on the House bill that you have before you shows you um, is identical to what they did to the Senate bill. Okay, so they're both in the same posture? Um, so they are both the same posture. What the House did is not only did they accept um, how you guys amended it, but then beginning on page, um, I don't have page numbers, it looks like page 8 or 9 of the reprint, section 3 of the bill. Um, they just mod they just amended the provision that looked at the study on the current practices for um, making recommendations on academic program review. They altered that to have uh, the Department of Legislative Services contract with a consultant to do the study um, about it and then to report that final report on September 1st, 2022 with an interim report December 1st, 2021. Um, so that is now the posture of that bill, and it is the posture of um, the amendments for the House Bill 1. So together they would now match if you were to vote uh, to amend House Bill 1 and vote to concur on the Senate bill. Senator uh, Griffith, your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to concur on House Bill 1 and Senate Bill 1 to put them in, uh, adopt the posture that the House sent them to us. Second. Okay. So we can vote, we're, we're voting both of them at the same time in the same posture. All right. 
All those in favor? Unanimous. Um, as I understand, by the way, uh, uh, Senator um, uh, McRae is uh, chairing the uh, uh, Baltimore City delegation right now, so that's why he's not with us right now. Okay, um, Senate Bill 85. That's, that's Philip. I don't see him on the screen, Kim. There he is. Come on. Senate Bill 85. Just a second. Well, our uh, secondary on this, this is from EHE. This is a bill that would create um, a governor's office of immigrant affairs um, to assist immigrants in the state, um, establishes appointment powers, duties, responsibilities for the office and director. Um, fiscal note is about uh, 300,000, uh, grows to about 400,000 by fiscal year 26. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about this? There was, um, there, sorry, there was an amendment from EEG that um, altered it to stay subject to availability of funding. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you repeat that? No. Could you repeat that, Philip? What did you just say, Philip? There was an amendment uh, of, of EEG, page 3, line 11, to um, include language saying subject to the availability of funding. Um, is a provision relating to establishing a network of uh, neighborhood-based opportunity centers, uh, access to uh, certain programs, uh, pretty much the, uh, the, the office duties. So this is not a mandate, is that correct? Correct. With that uh, language, it's not a mandate. Or it makes it clear that it's not a mandate. So it, it wasn't a mandate to begin with, but that makes it correct. clear is what you're saying. And what did... Um, did they put that amendment on it, or are they expecting us to put it? Yes, that, that was that was an EHE amendment that was added on. Senator Rosepet. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about it. It's obviously oh. my bill. It's a pretty straightforward, yep. I think. Senator Edwards. Yeah, I didn't catch you here at the end. You said something about 2026. Is this a five-year program, potentially, or did I mishear what you said? I think that the fiscal notes just go out to 2026. Um, it'll, be, it'll be a permanent. Yeah, it'll be a permanent program. So it's got a sunset if you don't reaffirm. Is that what, what you're saying? Correct. So what this uh, might be asked, sponsor Bill, what's this do that they can't do otherwise? It, you know, it, it's a good question, and it really is the point. Is there's so many L agencies in state government that touch on opportunities, problems related to immigrants. There are housing issues, health right now, obviously, education. Uh, and there's no high level oversight of the integration of those issues. And that's really what this is about. Other states do it. Uh, it, it the, some cities do it. Some uh, counties do it. The, the idea is to have a coordinating and a point of entry to deal with issues related to immigration. Uh, that's really the point. S small staff at the at the governor's level, cross-cutting agencies, coordination, access, focus. Just a little. Actually, when I read it, I had a, a similar question because I know we have a lot of um, the governor. Ha I don't even know where they're all housed, but there's the Asian group, yeah, yeah. there's Hispanic. I mean, so we have all those entities. What? And to the to to the Senator Edwards' point, what what would this do differently, or maybe pull all that together? I don't know. You tell me. No, it, it, it's less about those ethnic specific organizations, which is more about community relations and community outreach. And they do a great job. I really do think they do a great job. And the governor's been very committed to it. Uh, now, this is more programmatic. This is like the issues related to school policy, issues related to health policy issues related to law enforcement. It's really more a, a programmatic than a relationship community issue. Gotcha. Senator Eckert. Thank you very much. Would this assist people or help figure out a way that for those people who want to become legal, I mean, you know, 
get status uh, as citizens, would that facilitate that and make it in a more organized, deliberative way? And the reason I say that, and I've entertained an idea like we've done with medical marijuana, why can't we create our own system and legitimize people while the federal government's trying to get their act together? Because so many people live and work and do pay taxes and are doing are great citizens in our community. And so how do we build and reinforce that community? And I didn't know if this would be one of the steps to be able to formalize that and then help expedite legal status. I think the answer to that question is basically no. no. That's not the purpose of this. This relates more to state services and state activities related to people, whether they're documented or undocumented. Okay. There are language issues. There are all kinds of issues that are cross-cutting. Uh, on that issue, though, actually other states have done that. Utah is a leader in the country in working on that issue. Uh, and if you're interested in that, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about it. But that's not what this bill is. This had nothing to do with immigration. This has to do with immigrants have particular situations, and we, we all know what they are. Uh, and they affect different ways we provide services. Okay, well, let me follow up on that because there are major issues with translation, right. with getting, um, we have multiple languages on, on the lower shore. So it, Spanish is not, that's only one. We have a whole lot of other folks, and through COVID, those groups have been trying to work together and organize, and I think in one way, I hate to create more bureaucracy, but on the other hand, there's a way that we could coordinate our efforts statewide so that we cannot reinvent the wheel. That's the and idea. And help each other um, share resources. And that's the only thing that would be helpful in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. You get some other people. Um, Senator Zucker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I think I had my answer. I think I had my questions answered. So, this is at basically a hundred foot level, whereas the Secretary of State of Maryland is more at the million foot level, with actually more of a, a worldview in terms of. Yeah, dealing. that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. And it's accurate. Yeah, I think I, I think so. The Secretary of State does great stuff in some of these areas, but it, it, it it's actually more externally focused. This is about delivering the goods. This is actually helping people in Montgomery County and in Prince George County and in Dorchester County and in Baltimore County and Baltimore City. Senator Young. Yeah, don't forget us. we got a lot of them, too. And uh, Frederick County. I'm sorry. Frederick. My God. And Garrett County. Go on um, so I guess I've kind of heard the answer, but this person is just a coordinator. He, he, really no, he or she really has no authority, but they just try to pull people together to find solutions? Is that the idea? Or do, does, does he, do they have authority? They do not have power beyond the fact that they are at the gubernatorial level. They're at the statewide level. And, and I say this having worked um, in the U.S. government a while ago. You don't need a lot of power if you're in the White House. <laughs> Just the fact that yeah. you're working there is like, okay, people will answer your phone calls, they'll coordinate, and they'll come to the meeting. And that's kind of what this is, is getting at the gubernatorial level. So would, would it be a cabinet post? No. 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 Okay, thank you. Senator Quarterman. Uh, yes. Uh, be more secondary. What was the, um, the committee vote? In, uh, was it EHE? Is that where it was? Let me find that. Uh, Kevin, do you have a I'm trouble finding it? Um, I actually have another question while that okay. search is in progress. Yep. Um, did the administration weigh in on this? Not to my knowledge. Not at all? I mean, nobody ever talked to me. They may have said something in the EHE.
What's that? Yeah. Senator Edwards? Oh, wait. We, do, we have an answer to that question. Yes? We got, we got some. That's because Kim is not here. Oh, okay. We got something from the state of Maryland uh, Commission on Civil Rights, obviously, within the Hogan administration. They came out in support, and I don't see any, just eyeballing it, I don't see any other correspondence from, from the administration. Who was that again? Uh, the, uh, uh, it's the state of America, the Governor's Office Commission on Civil Rights. They came in support? Support. Um, and I'm looking, I'm looking through, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, let's see, testimony, Governor's Office, uh, let's see, I don't see any other correspondence, just eyeballing it quickly, from, from the administration other than that commission that, that came out, whether it's for or against, I don't see. It's the commission, it's not, the, it's not an office of the administration, it's the commission. No, but it's a budgeted item within the yeah, yeah, operating budget of the state of Maryland. Yep, let's be clear. Looks like the vote was 7-4. Uh, Senator Edwards? Kind of a follow-up to your comments and the delegate from, or senator from the Eastern Shore. You know, you start things out and it's not really bureaucracy, but it grows into bureaucracy. And uh, the chairman mentioned these other uh, uh, their agencies, groups, whatever, that, that weigh in on specific groups. Uh, I haven't read the bill. I don't have it here in front of me, but I assume... I assume if you have this one person, could that person just coordinate all these other ones into what that person does? And that person could coordinate all these other agencies, so we're not going to create a whole whole uh, a bureaucracy. And just to follow up real quick uh, to what Philip said and what the chair said, I think he said something like uh, 300, 000, up to $300,000 a year if the chief executive puts it in the budget. So therefore, it is not mandatory. Is that correct? Yeah, the note would uh, provide the note estimates based on four positions, then some additional uh, startup costs. It's not mandatory. Could we uh, could we hold this bill for a day or till sure. Tuesday maybe to yep. see what? Uh, That's fine. Uh, maybe Did I do any more comments that before any we language or not, but something where it's person could coordinate all these already existing ones. We're not going to create a whole new bureaucracy at some point. No, I'm just happy to answer any questions. Before. Okay, thank you. I'm fine. Okay. Um, yeah, this is actually a good time to, to mention sort of timing. As we all know, next week is, um, actually not next week, but the Monday after next week is crossover. Um, who knows whether or not we'll be in a position to, about coming in on Saturday of next week or not. But obviously we want to get everything that we really want to get done um, moved. We've um, way more done than I ever thought we would. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. Good. <laughs> I think there's a couple other big things out there that we need to get going, um, in my mind at least. Yeah. Um, and I know people have their individual issues. So I want to point out, and I know I've met with some of you and we're trying to get together with everybody, that we want to make sure that um, uh, if there's things that we haven't taken action on yet and you'd like us to, make sure that you reach out to me or one of the staff members and we can get that on the queued up if we can. Um, but I suspect we will have several voting sessions next week. So there's still time to get it all done. Um, but, of course, we've got to get it through on the floor, too. So, um, But just back of the mind kind of stuff. Um, uh, 
All right, uh, 780. Senate Bill 780 uh, is out of EHE. You guys are secondary on it. You do have a reprint in front of you. They did make some uh, adjustments to it. Generally speaking, this is all new provisions dealing with emergency procurement during a state of emergency. And largely, it's about the type of notification that's required to be given to the Legislative Policy Committee. So um, to begin with, if basically there's a 72 hour when an emergency procurement is made during a state of emergency, um, they need to give uh, 72 hours, within 72 hours of the execution of the contract or the expenditure of the funds, they have to give written notice to LPC. Um, and one of the amendments that they did is instead of the copy of a procurement contract, the notice has to include the name and business address. Um, it would have been administratively burdensome to do a copy of the, pro of the contract. However, then what the EHE did is if the LPC requests a copy of the contract, then they can do so. Um, and then also what it does is it does alter a provision that deals with budget amendments. Um, as you guys know, during the interim, the administration submits budget amendments with the 45-day review for you guys to look at it. Um, and what this is saying is that um, it also, it's also codifying, this is on page 3 of the reprint lines 24 through 29. Um, this is saying notwithstanding any other provision of law, basically they can bring in a budget amendment um, if it's declared to be essential for public safety, health, and welfare. Um, this is language that is identical to what you guys adopt generally every single uh, back of the budget bill provision. Um, what is new here is that this provision is also saying that um, in a state of emergency the governor cannot waive that law he can waive lots of laws under under a state of emergency but not this one I, um, I, I kind of lost some of the last things you said there oh sorry um, so so it's codifying current practice as to you guys authorizing in the annual budget bill the ability to to just um, <coughs> To increase appropriations by budget amendment without the 45 day process basically if there's a, a state of emergency um, in general there are some protections throughout here you'll see the same language repeated for instance on page 3 lines 16 through 21 um, part of the governor's emergency authority is to waive any rules um, so there are provisions in here about the 72 hour notice um, that these are provisions that are not subject to that waiver under state of emergency. These provisions, meaning? The whole bill, about the 72-hour notice. So that is not waivable under this bill. Oh, you didn't I think it reprint. turns out we didn't have the, <laughs> we didn't have the reprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were. I guess that was part of the problem. I was trying, having a hard time following because we didn't have the bill. <laughs> All right, now you do. Would you like me to just kind of briefly? All right. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, on page two of the reprint, uh, these are the provisions that deal with 72 hours after the execution of the contract or the expenditure written notice to the LPC lines 18 you can see that they altered it from providing the copy of the contract to instead just information about the vendor and then after line 23 and why was that um, they received um, they received testimony from DGS that um, to meet the 72 hour thing apparently before providing a contract um, there's a lot of redacting of private information that needs to be done, and so DGS testified that it would be um, very difficult to redact that confidential uh, information and provide it within 72 hours. So the committee went with not requiring it in okay. every instance, but instead, if the LPC requ uh, requests it, then they would have to do it. Okay. Um, and then... Um, Let's see. Also, initially, the bill came in as uh, requiring the Office of Legislative Audits to conduct an audit of the emergency procurement. 
Uh, instead, the EHC committee decided to make that also upon request of LPC. Okay. Um, so then if you turn to bill page three, um, lines five, there's another 72 hour requirement that they need to, the governor needs to provide written notice to the LPC in the case that uh, if during an emergency the governor suspends a, a law, a rule, a regulation, things like that, he, within 72 hours he has to, the governor would have to identify what those laws are that are being waived to the LPC. Um, and then you can see line 16 through 21, this is the provision to make sure that these notification requirements in the bill are not subject to the waiver under a state of emergency. Okay. Um, and then lines 24 through 29, this is the annual budget language that is adopted. So it's codifying current practice. And then also with the language saying that the governor cannot waive that provision either in a state of emergency. Okay. I hate to make, make you say, <laughs> sort of explain it in one more different way maybe. Um, so if you take out everything that was already um, in budget language every year, what fundamentally is new? What fundamentally is new is um, in a budget analysis that you guys heard, um, I believe it was the DBM secretary, um, a lot of this notification was not happening during this state of emergency because the notification requirement on budget amendments and, and procurement and stuff is part of a statute, but the broad authority under a state of emergency is to waive any statute. So this basically means um, those provisions are not waivable, therefore notification has to And those to happen. provisions are the 72 hours things? Correct. Okay. Everybody understand this? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a little while to catch up with you, but Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> Senator Corbin. Uh, same question as before on these ones where we're secondary. What was the vote in the committee? I don't know that I have that camera so, view. Yeah. I have the, I have that one this time. <laughs> okay, uh, seven eighty. Yep. Uh, unanimous. <laughs> All those in favor. Okay, and look at that. We were unanimous too. All right. Uh, 883. 883, this is a bill you all are primary on, um, finance and secondary. This has to deal, this is kind of cleanup legislation related to the um, issue. There was an issue with out of state sellers of premium cigars and pipe tobacco um, remitting the tax to the comptroller. Um, I believe you should all have a reprint. Um, there were um, a couple of pieces that came up in the hearing as um, areas for potential amendment. Um, briefly, the, the first part of the bill is through, uh, through page nine is setting up a regulatory licensing uh, structure where you know, the you know, out-of-state sellers Philip, can I jump in for a minute? Because uh, Philip, so yes. there are a lot of parties that have been trying to get this right. Um, and they're, the, the bottom line, and I think everybody agrees to it, that, that people should be paying what they should be paying. This is all related to Wayfair on some level. Um, and we want to make sure that the, the local brick-and-mortar guys are paying the same thing as the, the people who will or on the internet, and there's a lot of confusion over the top, and there was back and forth. I just want to say, I believe everyone is, uh, well, I, I know more than believe, because I just talked to them all, 
that um, that everybody is on board. It's all agreeable. Everybody understands that it's fair to everyone. And I just wanted to say that, and I wanted to ask one thing because um, evidently I need to ask about some brackets on page nine. Okay, let me pull up the. Uh, Was that handled? Is, I mean, it's gotten to a very yes. smithing so, technical thing. Page nine, this, this uh, amendment here would deal with the Wayfair issue. So yes. um, striking this bracket, you would, you would leave uh, these brackets here. You would leave in current law the, the existing uh, Wayfair tax threshold standard. That was one of the issues raised um, during the hearing. So this so should the, fix the, 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 uh, what that I'm reading is the that, Wayfair standard. Um, the, the need to remove the brackets to return the Wayfair thresholds on page nine lines 21 to 26 yep so that has been done the that's the uh, brackets yeah are if you're seeing my screen share um so the brackets are being removed uh, highlighted sections so they, they okay very good and then um just uh also so everyone's aware because of the veto override there were some technical corrections to the existing law so that's um what what this uh, change here is the, the provisions that were introduced are reincorporated into the uh, law, but as introduced, that law is currently obsolete. So that's a, there's a corrective amendment to do that. Okay. But the brackets are removed in the amendment. The brackets are coming out, yes, in okay. the amendment. Okay. What's that? The brackets are in here now, but it will well, We have an out. amendment. Great. Thank yep. you. Yep. Yep. I, I, you know, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of this, we can certainly do that. But um, I think the answer is that that both the online people and the brick and mortar all are in a place where this should work. Move favorable. Second. With amendment. With amendment. All those in favor? <laughs> what, oh, you have a question? Sorry. Yeah. Senator Song has a question. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to hold it up. But I just had one question because I really I, I understand the Wayfair and what we talked about last year. But is this a out of state tax? Out of state tax? Yes, like they're taxing people that are not in the state of Maryland. That's yes. what the bracket issue. That's removing that's those brackets right. fixes that, so it maintains the existing legal standard for those those Wayfair thresholds that's already applicable for out of state sellers selling into the state. So it maintains the existing was uh, legal standards that we we've been doing. Um, hundred thousand, Philip. Hundred thousand. Uh, yeah, hundred thousand or two hundred transactions. Right. So it's the same thing. I mean, on some levels, this bill probably didn't need to happen, but people felt like it was confusing. Everything that we so this is really just making sure that everything we've done in the past is that everybody agrees that this is the way it should be interpreted. Any other questions? Right, so it should clean up the tax issue and then there's also the, uh, the licensing piece that requires the out-of-state sellers selling out of the state to be licensed. So Are you raising your hand for a question, other Senator? Licenses. Okay. So how does it work? Is it like self-reporting? Like if they, are they the ones telling us that they made 100000 Is the alcohol, tobacco folks looking at taxes or something? So the licensure piece of the bill kind of uh, addresses that issue. So by requiring uh, the state sellers to, to be licensed to sell into the state for the premium CRs and pipe tobacco, that'll create a nexus by which they can track to see whether they're hitting those waiver thresholds and then need to um, you know, com comply with the applicable tax uh, provisions for remitting those taxes. Okay, so we got a motion for uh, approval with uh, amendments. All those in favor? Unanimous, okay. Um, 901. 
Senate Bill 901 is um, the Emergency Management Resilient, Resilient Maryland Revolving Loan Fund. This is uh, an EHE bill um, that the committee here is secondary on. The bill would create a revolving loan fund for the Maryland Emergency Management Agency to administer, um, and they would provide loans to um, the local governments and nonprofits to address mitigation of hazards and natural disasters. Um, and the, um, the idea here, I think, is there's some federal money available under the STORM Act. So there's some un uncodified provisions that would hopefully, if federal money becomes available, uh, supplant the state money that's being required to be um, distributed to this fund. So the fund, or the bill as it was introduced, came in with a $5 million mandate. Uh, because this is all going to be capital, EHE amended that mandate to become a, a um, an operating mandate or a capital budget mandate so the governor could satisfy it by using the capital budget and then also increased the amount of the mandate from five million to ten million dollars um, and and then again the idea uh, in the uncodified language is that if federal funds are available to supplant this money that the federal funds be used first but the as I understand it the the money is to be used to as a match for federal money, right? Correct. So, so, they, so is, is, is this language suggesting that we would have federal money that we received that, that we would be then in turn able to use as the match for other federal money? Is that the suggestion? It's silent to that. I can't imagine the federal government would allow you to match federal dollars with, with federal right. funds. So the, so the provision about uh, supplanting or backfilling with federal money doesn't really doesn't kinda... really help if all it's going to be used for is to match federal dollars. This actually is an interesting program, and I think it's a, a, it may be a, an outstanding opportunity for the state because the match is huge, isn't it? Do you know? I don't know. I think it's ninety. I think it's a ninety percent match. Um, so given all that we have in this state shoreline and everything else we got going this is a big deal um, I'm actually um, going to hold this um, uh, but I think I, I wanted everybody to understand what, what's going on here we could get, literally get hundreds of millions of dollars if we play this correctly um, and that may be a very big deal for our, our shoreline state and of course other places around the state who have issue, issues with resiliency, um, like Ellicott City, for that matter, but 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 plenty of places in the state um, could use this, um, and if we can leverage at a ninety percent uh, match, um, it may make a lot of sense to do a, an investment. Senator Eckert. So it said ninety percent uh, federal. Yes. Match. Yes. So our ten percent leverages that much for our rural communities. Yep. On a variety of projects. Could be any, yes, any kind of resiliency project. Got it. I yeah, this is, this is a big deal. Got it. Thank you. Oh, that, Senator Peters. So I guess a, a couple questions. You're going to hold it, but maybe we can find out. Would this handle the flooding, a lot of the flooding money? that Because right now we have a flooding fund, mm -hmm. and everybody started with one, and now there's five groups that want that money. Uh -huh. And there's three capital projects this year for flooding. So, I mean, it's an issue. So, I guess that's the first question. Would, they, yep. would we then take that money? And then second, um, what if there's money available this year, you know, with stimulus? Do we still have to set the fund up? Do we make an emergency bill? It's kind of a question for you. Timing issue, yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, if we, if we have to expedite the, creating the fund, basically. Did you want to say something? Right. So it, you can't mandate this year, but if you created the fund, it would be within the governor's discretion to transfer money in there. He could bring in a budget amendment that would transfer money in there. And also, if, if there were federal dollars that could somehow be used through this fund, um, you could also, the governor could redirect the federal dollars if the fund was set up. But, but we you, could put capital in this year. You could put cap, you could direct capital so in the, this And the year, federal yes. money is available now. Yep. Correct. 
This, uh, this is an interesting opportunity, I think. Um, really could be quite good. Senator Eckert, I mean Eckert, Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question, uh, page uh, four, line four. This is, it says it's a loan, so if someone utilizes and takes out a loan, does that, sometimes you get words mixed up down here, does that mean they have to pay that back? And if so, does it go into the fund, back into the fund, or does it go to the general fund? That's number one. And number two, it says that, uh, I think it's a good idea. I'm just asking these questions, so you know. Sure. The uh, budget, uh, the annual state operating budget bill or capital budget bill appropriation, the governor put in at least ten million dollars for the fund. Does that mean that the first year, if you use it all, you just put ten million in next year, or if you only use half of it, five million? You only have to put five million. You have to keep it ten. I guess what I'm asking is, is a ten million dollar balance each year. Or you automatically have to put $10 million in, and it could build up to whatever if it's not used. What what does this mean? So for question one, the repayment would go back to the fund. It wouldn't go to the general fund. Um, and to question two, yes, the, the money could be building up <laughs> over... Um, there is no there is no cap on the amount that's in there. The way, the way subsection M is written, each fiscal year... Um, there would be an appropriation to the fund. Obviously, if the legislature felt that the, the fund was building a, a fund balance that was too high, it would clearly be within the, the powers of the legislature to cut, cut that appropriation. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions about this? I think I – can we get some more information on the uh, – is it spelled out in the, um, the bill about – um, the process for re repayment? Um, the bill requires the agency, the um, MEMA, um, to spell that out. The, it, it, the repayment is, it needs to be low or no interest. So the, it says that it has to, has to be low, low and no interest. But other than that, me, uh, MEMA would be the ones to determine how the, the repayments are going to work. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea, I, I would hope, would be that it was, um, we gave a lot of flexibility to the localities um, to be able to take their time in getting this, those kinds of things repaid. That would be my preference. Senator Sollings? Oh. But, Senator Sollings. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Knowing that we're secondary and, and EHE is the primary, and seeing and hearing what I'm hearing, it, this is something that's beneficial for our state and for communities. We have, an, we have a couple areas that have some problems with flooding. And we're working with one area, Turner Station, to help them out. And we're going to MDE to prevent the flooding in their community. And just knowing something like that, if this is beneficial for our state, I, I, I don't know why we're holding up the vote. I think it's a really good bill from what I'm hearing, and it's a benefit for us. Yeah, the, the, the reason that I think we should hold it, Senator, is that I'm not sure that we're putting enough effort into it, financial effort into it. Sounds good to me. I thought you might think that. <laughs> Senator Peters. Thank you. On that note, Mr. Chair, yes. I have a letter from the Treasurer requesting $25 million. She uh, has extensive knowledge so matt you know you want probably want to call christian lund because uh, they've done a lot of research on the fund and i, I was kind of curious is, is there a number that triggers something you know is, is there that's why the 25 was interesting but the treasurer cop has sent a letter for 25 just fyi right yeah and i think certainly if we have the capacity and and capital it, it makes it sort of quick and easier for us to get engaged on this fund. Um, so just trying to get through all that. But that's, that's where my head is. Senator Elfrith. Thank you, Mr. Just, just briefly, I, I thank you to Senator Peters for bringing that up. All my conversations with the Treasurer about the pension system, she's very concerned about uh, our, our rating system and, and that New York is going to start looking at resiliency and looking at climate change as its impact on, on our stability as a state. So I think this is a great investment to make. Thank you. Good point. Good point. 
Okay. Um, 919. So Senate Bill 919 is also a... Um, oh, no, this bill is with you. Uh, this, is, this is only a budget and tax bill. Um, this is the uh, Horse Racing Fairhill Natural Resources Management Area. Um, this bill does does a few different things. The uh, the first is it it, um, it 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 repeals the minimum number of race days if the Cecil County Breeders Fair is holding a race meet at the Fairhill Natural Resources Management Area. There's a state law that requires that the, that race meet uh, include at least two racing days. This would repeal the floor so that it, there would be no requirement for two racing days. Um, in addition, there's a requirement that the, the racing days coincide with an agricultural fair that includes livestock competitions. Um, this, would, this would just make that, that require, that would change that to authorizing. So they could have the, the livestock uh, agricultural fair during the race meet, uh, but they would no longer be required to do it. Um, the next thing it does is it repeals a requirement that for each flat race that occurs, that you have a steeplechase or a hurdle race. And so now you could just have all flat races rather than having to have a one-for-one one, um, race, like a flat race and a steeplechase race for, for, each, for each flat race you do. You don't have to have a steeplechase race. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is this, okay. is this for just Fairhill? This is for just Fairhill. Just Hill. Fair Hill, so it doesn't affect anybody else. Correct. Um, the next piece of it is the um, the takeout on the handle for uh, any gambling, any um, any wagering that's going on during these races is set in state law at twenty five percent. The language here would authorize the takeout to be up to 25%. So the, the entity could, could adjust the, um, the takeout rate below 25%. And then it also uh, makes clear how much of that takeout then, uh, or it adjusts how much of that takeout is then going to go to the, um, um, go to the uh, Fairhill Improvement Fund. And then finally... At the end of the, the reprint, this is where the, the sponsor has submitted a, um, a sponsor amendment. He, he, the sponsor adjusts the, um, um, the mandated appropriation piece here to require that in fiscal 2023, the mandate would be $1.8 million, and then in fiscal 2024 through 2027, the mandate would be $1.3 million for the... Um, um, for the fund to be used for various purposes related to um, events at the Fair Hill Natural Resources Management Area. And what what did we uh, what has been the budget in the last couple of years for this? Um, there is there's two million dollars in a deficiency appropriation for this year. There's nothing in the twenty that's tech, the deficiency appropriation is technically twenty one money um, that should be available soon. There's nothing in for 2022. There was a large tranche of money in 2019. There was nine million dollars for the the um, the area um, that was that was in that was in 2019 to to help build the facility. It looks like um, they're they're building out and trying to attract. They're, they're called five star equestrian events, um, and that seems to be what what some of this is about is is they they do these equestrian events where it's uh, dressage cross country and show jumping and so i think some of the money has been been spent to build out that that side of the the um facility and then the other piece is the the racing pieces that i went through okay people have quite oh uh senator young a couple questions yep did i read and hear you right that we're funding this amount of money each year for racing, but they don't have to have any races. Right. the The money isn't necessarily for racing. It's it's for the the uh, the facilities there. Um, in theory, they could they could not do any races. Um, in it's fact, not just races, right? What's that? It's not just it's not just races. It's it's event, It's equestrian eventing. Um, so, so your dressage and your cross country and your jumping, it's a, it's an Olympic event that they, that, well, it's an Olympic event, but then this is what people do on, um, when the Olympics aren't going on. And so the, it's not just racing that's going on at the facility. 
Um, and that's what that's what I think a lot of this this mandate piece is about is about um, building out that side of the the um, uh, that side of the facility. I'm, I'm new to this. Are we doing this for other type horse facilities around the state also? Well, we, the legislature did pass a large bill last year for uh, Pimlico and Laurel um, to, to build out those facilities. But there, the, I'm not aware of um, I'm not aware of any other public, um, and I'm sure there might be other public uh, horse facilities in the in the state. This one's a little unique. The the Department of Natural Resources bought this land in the 30s from the DuPonts, and it's been used as sort of this this um, quasi public. Um, they've had a relationship with the Cecil County um, Breeders Association or the nonprofit that operates this uh, these events there, and so it's DNR owned land that that's then been used for various events in Cecil County over the years. Prince George's County has an indoor facility for this type of event, doesn't it? They may, they may, yes. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. I I was there once. I just assume it's still going on. Yeah. That's a, yeah. In Upper Marlboro. Parking. In Upper Marlboro, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Governor Glenn Denning had Governor's Ball or something there. I was there too. I remember. Yes. He saw you there. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know how many fairs are still in existence, but a lot of the fairs had racetracks. Are, are we still doing funding there too? I'm just wondering how I mean, much. Well, Timonium, of course, is is, uh, is certainly part of the uh, what the house has already passed for sports betting, and um, the whole purpose of uh, of that was that I mean it's already got a uh, off-track betting site there, and the expansion of sports betting there is. Can, conceptually to help pay for um, the upkeep of yeah. the Timonium facility. But how about other fairgrounds? I don't know. Have we had... I believe we've we've provided funding in the capital to fairgrounds over the years for when when uh, entities have come in for bond bills. I can check and see how much how much has been spent on on uh, that in, in capital. I, mean, I know a lot of the fairgrounds used to have tracks, yeah, and, and I know some still do. I don't know how many. Yes, yeah. just... yep. I mean, so the the interesting thing about this one, at least from my perspective, is that it sounds like it's becoming a big deal. Like mm -hmm. there are only so many of these around the world, I think, and um, it's uh, as as a facility, as a venue for something to come to. Um, I, I think it's yeah. interesting. Uh, I'm not speaking against it. I'm just curious as to how much of this. How yeah, many no, it's of these a good, we're it's doing a good question. I mean, we're not voting on it today. Yeah. Um, but but this is why I wanted to bring this out um, because um, I do think um, it may be. Look, I I think, and I know you all do too. Is I, I keep looking for whatever unique opportunities wherever it is across the state. To, to have a shine where we can, if, if it's affordable and we can make it make uh, a jurisdiction shine, that's what I'd like to see happen. So, Senator Eckert. Thank you very much. This is a very unique issue. So I can't. I can't hear you. There you go. Oh, okay. Thank you. This is a very unique niche area, if you will. Um, it's competitive in that you have Delaware, you have Pennsylvania that all do some of this. But this will create even a more specialized opportunity that I think, you're right, is up and growing. And I remember Delegate Mary Rowe walk up championing this way back when <laughs> and always said it was one of our prized venues in the state and it was never given the attention it needed. So I think it's a, a very important project for that area. Thank you. Senator Stalling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you covered it. I think when we heard the testimony, it was exactly what you stated. That's why I pushed it that this was a unique place. This is one of the opportunities in the state of Maryland to get something like this. So it's like something that they're trying to promote, to bring out, to show this is a great thing that Maryland's going to get, has the opportunity to get. So I just was agreeing with you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, 
let's uh, let's try to get some of that stuff that Senator uh, Young has asked for. So we, we want to know how many how many fairgrounds in the state still have tracks at them? Is that the question? Yeah, I, I was just curious as to with racing type events, how many different things we're we're doing. Yeah. Um, I know in in uh, Frederick at the fair we have the. Uh, races with the uh, yeah it's terrible I'm not into uh, horse racing the the surreys or whatever you call them behind him I, I've driven it a couple times sulkies hmm? sulkies yeah and I, I was just wondering how many there are around and how much we fund them and are we consistently doing that again I'm not speaking against it I'm just curious yeah about yeah that. no 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 I got you fair fair question Okay, last one, and then uh, looks like we might hopefully have a little time before hand um, before session. Uh, Nine forty-three. Um, this is a bill that I just uh, was a late fall for me. Um, been working with the university system. Uh, who's got? Oh, Eric's okay. got this. Yep. Um, so several years ago when the strategic partnership was formed between the College Park campus and the University of Maryland Baltimore campus, two centers were established and were uh, funding was mandated for those centers. Um, you do have a reprint on your desk, is that correct? Okay, great. Yes. Um, so what this bill does is as it was introduced, it would increase um, the funding for the two centers. Um, it would increase... It's the wrong reprint I'm looking at here. Anyway, um, here's my reprint. Here's the right one. So on page two of the reprint, um, you can see that the current funding for the particular center at the University of Maryland Baltimore campus, um, and this is the center that deals with like research and development, grants, and tech transfer, um, that they were funded at $4 million under current law. This bill would increase their total funding to $6.5 million under the amendment, um, with $4 million generally for the center, and then $2.5 million for the center to use specifically to encourage the development and location of university-created or sponsored technology companies in the city. Then for the center that is located at College Park, um, this is the center that deals with um, advancing the education of students in certain degree areas. So on page three of the reprint, uh, the bill would add to the list of what those degree areas are, adding quantum technologies, advanced data computing, and information technologies. And then to go along with that, um, some additional funding for this center as well, which is on page four of the reprint. Um, well, at the bottom of three and page four. So the $6 million annual um, would remain. And then in addition to that, another $2.5 million to be used to encourage the development and location of university-created or sponsored technology companies in Prince George's County. Uh, the last thing that the bill does is in this section two uncodified on page four, uh, when the initial strategic partnership was developed back in 2016, one of the provisions of that bill um, had to do with providing assistance to the primarily residential campuses. The strategic partnership bill was mostly about your research campuses, and so um, there was a provision to include the residential campuses to increase their funding to reach a certain um, level, what's called the funding guideline attainment. Um, that funding from the initial bill expired in fiscal 21. This would um, continue that effort of increasing their funding guidelines for fiscal year 23 through 27 at $4 million uh, to be distributed to those campuses. So um, I, I think um, that clearly the, that this program, this Empower, um, which was the the merging of sorts uh, of the campuses, particularly from a research perspective, and, uh, and sort of calculating um, the uh, combined amount of research dollars has, I, I believe, pretty, been pretty wildly successful in that sense. I can't remember what 
we were separately before, but I think we're at nine in the nation right now, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, does anybody remember that? Mm. I, don't remember. I, I think that's right. Uh, Senator Peters is shaking his head. Um, uh, you know, this has been um, quite successful, and obviously when you reach the, the, uh, the upper limits, if you will, um, in that world, uh, money attracts money. And um, that's been very positive for our state. This is a continuation of that, sort of updating that and putting some more resources into that. The one that is of particular interest um, is uh, the fact that quantum computing, which I'm going to do a really poor job talking about because uh, I've heard several um, I've been briefed slightly on, on it several times, and every time you walk away a little bit scratching your head. Um, but the bottom line is this is a type of computing uh, that is sort of beyond um, what anyone, I guess any one of us really understands, but is needed and can be used in solving problems that are extraordinary. And we have become, at College Park, um, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a, a big-time deal leader on this. Um, the main company that has come out of the Discovery Zone in College Park, uh, INQ, um, which if you look in the papers, it just came out the other day that they are going public and um, I think are the only and the biggest uh, publicly traded in, in this quantum computing world. The bottom line is um, this is another one of those, I think, extraordinary opportunities. This one's a, and we have an existing program that has been doing very well, and I, I believe we can take it to the next level. So that's, that's why I brought it forth. That's why they came to me, and uh, I think we really should uh, jump into this uh, all the way, um, but uh, open for questions, of course. Uh, Senator Eckert. Thank you very much. So are these funds that go to the development of the program, or are these funds that will go to private entities? The, the funds go directly to the university, to the center, to be used. Now, whether they, you know, subcontract out or, or things like that, exactly, I'm, I, that I don't know. But these appropriations would go to the centers within College Park and, you know, UMB. Correct. But then what do they do with it? It's like tech, tech transfer, kind of. Mm -hmm. So it would go to companies like Quantum Computing? I'm just trying to understand it. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and is yeah. that a private company? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so they built this discovery zone at, at the University of Maryland where, where they're, I mean, it's, it's all about taking what the university has to offer in learning and, and ability and sort of transferring it into a technology that can be marketable. And um, this has become a pretty extraordinary one. You have a question? Senator? I have a question. Senator McCray first. Senator McCray. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I see in the fiscal note, it's not in the bill, but in the fiscal note, it talks that it does affect our community colleges in some capacity, so I'd just like to hear a lot more about how this does affect Baltimore City Community College. And also, I just wasn't, so I wasn't sure the correlation between that, but also from an HBCU standpoint, I know that we have two of them inside of Baltimore City, so I just want to make sure that I'm not indirectly, adversely impacting my HBCUs while I, if, taking a vote on this bill. Sure. So um, the way that the community colleges come in um, is not related to the particular funding for the two centers that's being mandated here. The, the way that the community colleges and um, Cylinder, um would be impacted is by the uncodified in section number two on page four, which is the additional $4 million going to the comprehensives to increase their funding guidelines. Um, so as additional money goes to the four years, that is then incorporated into the calculation for community colleges and cylinder. 
the additional money that's for the two centers is actually, actually explicitly stated to not be included into the calculation for community colleges um, because it's for a center. You know, it's not it's not for students and things. So, um, you understand? So it will actually theoretically increase. Well, it it will, and the fiscal note has some numbers in there. Um, on page six of the fiscal note, it indicates the impact on the community colleges. Um, and Selinger over time, um, resulting from the guideline attainment funds. So you can see, I don't, I don't have a breakdown of each community college. I don't think they included that. But in general, um, by fiscal 2027, um, the impact on community colleges would be upwards of $5 million um, and 1.4 for Selinger. And Mr. Chair, I only asked the question because you know that the other community colleges fall within the CAID formula, so we don't always understand the uh, BCCC doesn't have that same formula, but I know that it's taken care of indirectly in the budget. So just making sure that we understand that commitment. That's obviously the community colleges for the K formula is explicitly stated, but making sure that we also remember that two, three years from now when BCCC is uh, in this equation. I didn't, I couldn't understand that piece of it. BCCC has the same funding formula. So for both BCCC, the community colleges, and for Selinger, their funding is all based on a certain percentage of what the four-year schools get. So because under this bill, the four-year schools will be getting this additional funds, that would flow through to all of those three other entities in the exact same way. Got it. And just the HBCU part, if anybody want to comment on that piece yep. of it. So the HBCU, with the funding guidelines provision, it's saying that this uh, additional $4 million infusion um, is to help them reach the 68% of the goal. If, if I can give you the background of funding guidelines, it's a, if you need it, it's a complicated way of just kind of re measuring the relative investment in um, Maryland campuses as compared to some of our competitor states. Um, on page five of the fiscal note tells you what the fiscal 21 attainment is right now. So essentially this $4 million would be distributed to help schools reach 68%. Um, so if in this chart they're less than 68%, then they would be eligible to get this additional infusion. And so that was um, Salisbury, Towson, um, Let's yeah. see, Baltimore, Baltimore County. UMBC. Yep, UMBC. Um, Eastern Shore is already at 90%. Um, Bowie's at 68%. Coppin's at 119%. So they're already above this 68% goal. And what about Morgan? Yeah, I don't see them on here. I don't, let me see if it says it verbally. Um, because this $4 million right. is only applicable to University System of Maryland schools. Do we know what percentage they would be, Mr. Chair, if they were included in this? We would have a funding guideline attainment number for Morgan. I'd have to check back with the budget analyst to get that, but we track it for them as well, I believe. Thank you. Director. Thank you very much. So the out year twenty four million encompasses all of those costs, the cost not only to the university system but also to our community colleges. And then it sounds like if be if Baltimore needs to be added into that is I'm hearing. So that would be an additional Baltimore City Community College? Yeah. That's already in. Oh, they're already in. Yep, okay. they're already in. Um, and yes, that, that cost includes um, not only the money for the centers, but also for, as you just stated, those additional. Okay. Yep. So that's the explanation for the $24 million in the fiscal note. Correct. Yeah. And largely the $24 million is, so this $4 million going to the funding guidelines in order to, and, the, and this was true with the 2016 Strategic Partnership Bill as well, um, it's, it's $4 million in year one then $8 million in year two because that four gets added to the base. So in order to actually increase the attainment, it, like each year builds on itself. So that's the large, and this is laid out in... So it's an accelerating mandate? Yeah, it's a compounding mandate. 
Um, so by 2027, the guideline attainment is estimated at, uh, well, will be $20 million. So that's the largest part of the, the cost. Uh, does it level off from there? Uh, yes, because the infusion of the funds expires okay. in 2027. Got it. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Roosevelt. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm for this, and I was for Senator Miller's effort to put this whole initiative together. And the, th the thing I know about here is obviously what's going on in the Discovery District in College Park and the company and all that stuff, which is terrific. And it, it's important because at least in our area, um, we've been losing companies with technology that's developed at the University of Maryland uh, to other parts of the country. I say with other parts of the state with great respect, but the whole point is to try to keep them as close as possible to, um, to the university and in Prince George's County. Same thing for, for, for Baltimore. Um, so that I like. I guess I'd like to hold this if we could till Tuesday, though, because I have the same question that uh, Senator Eckert I don't really know how the money's been spent. I know it's a good thing, and I know it's working, but yep. I would like to little know about how money's spent. That's number one. Number two is, and just to kind of understand the fiscal impact of this, because I gather basically there's sort of two unrelated parts of the bill. One relates to the Empower. Thing, and the other relates to just funding formulas for the other campuses. Yeah, that was part of the original agreement. Um, right. No, I. I yeah. I, 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 just, I, I, so just so you know, yeah. the, the the and and to follow back up with them, um, the 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 agreement this time was that they were happy at the same funding level as long as it was continued for five more years. So they is who. Uh, essentially, it's led by UMBC. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay, I, I guess all I would say is, I, I, believe me, I get the politics. I was on the Board of Regents, yeah. <laughs> and I know the way it works between the different campuses. Yep. Uh, but I really would, but I, but I didn't realize that was part of this bill, frankly, and I wanted to kind of understand a little bit. Better. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, that being said, are there any other questions on this? Okay, um, that concludes our voting session for today. Um, we will vote uh, again, I would say, multiple times next week, and uh, there will be some more bills that we'll be putting on. Uh, and that's a wrap for today. Senator Quarterman. Just be, um, Monday, anything on Monday? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, I know where the brief is. What's that? I know. Voting in the morning. Right? What? Oh, yeah. uh, we're voting on Monday. Oh, okay. Three o'clock. What? We have that joint here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, 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 oh! Wait a second. Yeah, because we uh, actually stay tuned on that possible Monday. I forgot that we were. Oh well, that's virtual though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's virtual. No, no, not on Monday. Great. Right answer, Mr. No. Chairman. Right answer, right answer. <laughs> so I can stay home on Monday?